Thank you for downloading this podcast from Talk Radio 702 and 567 Cape Talk. For more podcasts and more information on your number one news and talk station, please visit 702.co.za or capetalk.co.za. The Naked Scientist on Talk Radio 702 and 567 Cape Talk with Reedy Direco. Well, Kido Cub is in for Reedy Direco on the Reedy Direco show, and they should call him the naughty scientist. He's become a Facebook friend, so I think I should call him that. Chris Smith, good morning. Kino, hello. Very, very good. Chris, just a quick question to deviate. Is it possible that if you eat lots of chicken that you can get man boobs like the Brotier, like our, our national cricket team? Well, there was a claim that eating certain amounts of certain foods which had, when those foods were alive in the form of living, eating, breathing animals, mm. if those animals had been dosed with various drugs and hormones, that those hormones could find their way into the consumer and could have an effect. The evidence for that was that when there was the Olympics a few years back, some athletes were worried that they were going to be testing positive for certain banned substances mm. because similar substances were being given to animals in order to make the animals put on weight and put on muscle. In other words, they were anabolic steroids they were giving the animals. And, and this could be picked up because the tests they're using in the context of things like the Olympics are so sensitive. Whether or not there's actually any good quality documented cases of people getting man boobs, though, not sure. I'd have to look into that. Sorry, Keno. No, not a problem at all. Not a problem. Just something I noticed at the last T20 game. But we are taking calls, of course. Chris Smith, the Naked Scientist. By the way, you're going to check him out on the web. You can do that. You go to www.thenakedscientist.com. I was going to say .co.za. For a second there, I thought you moved to South Africa. So it's uh, www.thenakedscientist.com is where you need to go check it out. So essentially what you can do is give us a call. Any questions that you have and you're looking for a scientific answer to it. Okay, don't raise the whole God thing, because I don't think we can answer that one. But uh, the, you can raise it, okay, by giving us a call on double eight three zero seven zero two count ten, the Western Cape, four four six zero five six seven. Now, Chris, as you very well know, I'm bald, right? And I, I believe that scientists have now figured out how to make new hair cells. Yeah, but they're not those kind of hair cells, Aren't unfortunately. Mm. We're not going to be restoring heads of hair. In fact, this is probably more important even than that. This is the hair cells that you find in your ears. Because oh. in the inner ear, the structure called the cochlea, mm. which has the important job of turning sound waves, the vibrations in air molecules, into brain waves, in other words, neurological se- sort of information that the brain can understand, which we decode as speech and radio mm. programs and music, important things. Mm. Those cells, there are about 15,000 of them in each ear, are only in short supply. There's a limited supply of them because you have to make the ones you're born with last a lifetime. There's no capacity in mammals like humans to replace them. Some animals can. Birds, mm. for example, can make new hair cells. The problem is if you lose them, you can't do that transduction. You can't turn sound waves into brain waves and you go deaf. And current research suggests that because we're living in such a noisy environment with music, nightclubs, and the fact that there are various drugs and things that can also damage hearing, probably one person in three, by the time we reach old age, will have a significant hearing loss or deafness, to put it another way. So researchers are quite eager to find out how these hair cells work and how we might be able to set about protecting them to make them break down or be damaged less or even replace them with either new ones or persuade the ones we've got to divide, make more of themselves in situ to make up for any losses. The big problem is that these cells are very difficult to study because A, they're stuck in the middle of the ear, and B, they're really hard to grow in a dish. When scientists have tried to culture them or make other cells turn into them, they've found it very, very difficult. But finally, this nut has been cracked. There's a paper in the journal Cell this week. It's a researcher at Stanford in America called Stefan Heller, and he and his colleagues have discovered in mice how you can take a skin cell, a cell type called a fibroblast, and by giving it a cocktail of growth factors, you can fool it into thinking that it's in a developing embryo again and make that cell turn into these hair cells. So by turning the cells initially into stem cells and then giving them these growth factors, Mm. this group in Stanford have successfully managed to produce these tiny hair cells in 
the dish, and this means that now they can produce lots of them and begin to study them in much more detail. The cells they've produced do produce these tiny hairy filaments which come off of one end of the cell, and what those hairs do is when sound vibrations hit the hairs, it, they deform the hairs, and these then open little pores in the surface of the cell, making the cell become electrically active. They've been able to demonstrate the ones they make in the dish work the same way and this is really encouraging because it now says we can begin to study these cells and work out how to replace them repair them or protect them okay that's uh, of course we're going to go to your calls in double eight three oh seven oh two car 10 western cape four four six oh five six seven and all i can say is uh, sir send me the message um wrong here sir here we go hey you have to stick with your bald head and uh, this one's got to do with the ears uh, let's go to john in linden chatting to the naked scientist hi john hi how are you good and you yeah i have a question for the naked scientist about um Rugby and the theory of relativity. Um, basically, the, my question is about the forward pass in rugby. If, if two players are on the same side and um, they're stationary and one is, say, a meter further from the try line than the other and player A passes to player B uh, behind him, that's, that's a legitimate pass. If player B is closer to the try line than that's the forward pass, they're both stationary. However, if they're both running at speed towards the try line, Player A is closer to the try line than player B. Is it not possible that if he's going fast enough, that if he passes behind him to player B, that in relation to player B, the pass goes back, but in relation to the field, the, 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 the pass goes forward? Interesting. Chris? Oh, dear. I'm trying <laughs> to get my head around this. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> Uh, can, can, can we just try and get this straight on paper? Can we just step through it again, John? Because sure. um, so I, I, I need to think about this. So you and I are on the same team. Um, and yep. you're, we're stationary. We're not running. Um, yep. you're, uh, we're facing the, the opponent's try line. You're a meter behind me. I pass to you. That's a legitimate pass. If you're okay, so let's call you. You're, you're player A and I'm player B. Right. Now, and, I'm standing, and I'm standing just behind you. Right, and we're both stationary. And you're going right. to pass... And you're going to do a pass back to me, which is perfectly right. legitimate in the rules of rugby. Right. Now, let's say right. um, you're, you're a meter closer to the try line than I am, and we're, and we're still both stationary, and I passed you. That's obviously a forward pass. And that's yeah, so, so if we reverse that situation, and you're standing behind me, and you boot me the ball, that's now a forward pass, and that's right. a foul. Right. Right. Now, let's say we're both running towards the try line. So, so yep. we're, quite, we're quite speedy runners. We're running close to 10 meters per second. Um, yep. And you're still a meter behind me, you're a meter farther from the time than I am, and say so you're about five meters away from me, um, if I pass you the ball at a given speed, is it not possible that although the ball is traveling behind me in relation, when I pass the ball to you, it's going behind me because you're behind me, however, in relation to the field, it's going forward towards the try line because we are we are moving in yeah i i get your i see what you're saying oh. because the point is that um when you're running the ball will have your velocity exactly. plus exactly. the velocity you give it when you throw it yeah. and you're absolutely right that uh the ball will be carried forward a bit as you're running forward because when you launch the ball obviously you will give it velocity in a certain right. direction but it will already have velocity because you're moving yeah. but i think I, i'm not a rugby referee maybe yeah. someone who is and, and you know uk south african rugby bit of a sore subject since the last <laughs> world cup um but maybe if someone is a rugby referee they can tell us i think that the the rule is that when the ball passes it's yeah. it's relative to the person who actually is throwing it because otherwise everyone would be would be creating a forward pass because the ball yeah. is always going to be if they're moving if they're not stationary like you allege yeah. they would always be f guilty of creating a forward pass but it's a really good point because i mean this this sort of physics goes beyond just rugby playing if yeah. you look at say airplanes firing bullets and things right. if you have a gun on the front of your airplane and you fire a bullet from the gun um, then obviously the gun bullet gets the velocity of the the bullet anyway, uh, say it leaves the gun at a thousand miles an hour, uh, it will also have added to it the speed of the aeroplane. So the aeroplane's doing, let's say, 250 miles an hour, the bullet will end up doing a thousand miles an hour plus 250 equals 1,250 miles an hour. Right. But if the gun is mounted on the back of the aeroplane, then the gun fires in the opposite direction to the aeroplane and this means the bullet will actually be traveling more slowly so in right. other words the bullet leaves the gun at a thousand miles an hour but the aeroplane is going 250 miles an hour the opposite direction the bullet therefore is now only doing 750 miles an hour and if you speed up your aeroplane and speed up your aeroplane until the aeroplane is doing the same speed as the bullet is eventually you'll get to a point where the bullet comes out of the gun and falls to earth because uh, it's not going anywhere 
Well, listen, th th thanks for... <laughs> it's a really interesting question. Yeah. Thank you, John. Yeah, well, yeah, I, 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 if anyone does know if, if the rugby rule books refer to this sort of... It's point, interesting. You know, Fascinating. I'd be interested to know. Because I've seen it in replays I often see that it seems that the ball, in relation to the field, is going forward, even though it's going to a player who was behind the player who passed the ball. I think most rugby coaches, would, um, referees would sit there and scratch their heads, quite frankly. <laughs> nothing to, I'm saying nothing about their intelligence. It's just that, I mean, you've given my brain a workout this morning as well. Even Chris's. Now, there's, there's something. I mean, his, right. his brain works out all the time anyway. Let's go to Evan in Germiston. Hi, Evan. Hi, good morning, guys. How are you? Good, thanks. Good, good, good. Look, uh, probably not the most scientific question you've ever had. Um, uh, on my hands free on my cell phone, for instance... There's on, on the little earphones that go into your ears, there's a left and a right. And on like, like your iPod and that kind of thing. Does it really matter? Because I always tend to look before I put them into my ear, which side is left, which side is right? And then put them in my ear. Does it really matter, guys? Yeah, it's a question we all ask. Well, uh, there, there, are, there are two aspects to this, Evan, and, it, and it's a good question. One aspect is an anatomical one, which is that some very expensive headphones are slightly different shapes because the, the lug hole, that's the non-anatomical term for the bit you stick your finger in and wiggle it around in your ear, the ear hole, where the sound goes in, that has an, an asymmetry in its anterior, posterior direction, in other words, front and back. So the headphone bud will fit better on one side than the other if it's one of these sort of anthropomorphic, um, specially designed earphones for comfort and staying in and all that kind of thing. So side can make a difference. The other point is purely an audiophilic one for people who are music purists and want to get the stereo image correct so that uh, if they know that when they were watching a concert and their favourite singer was standing on the right-hand side of the stage and their favourite guitarist was on the left and that when the sound is rendered, the stereo image means that that is reflected in the recording. If you swap the headphones around, your memory will be distorted because the singer will appear dominating the left side, apparently, because it's going into your left ear, and the guitar on the right. So from a music purist point of view, if you want to get the accurate stereo image with the format and layout that the original producer envisaged, you need to put the ears on, right? Unless you're listening in mono, of course. If you're listening in mono, it doesn't make any difference because you're putting the same signal into right and left. Mm -hmm. And from an anatomical point of view, some headphones and earbuds are set up so they fit better um, with one side or the other for, for comfort and, and fit and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so what you're saying is, like, on my phone, if I'm just busy on a voice call, it doesn't really matter. But if I'm listening to music, for instance, mm -hmm. over my phone, then it would make a difference. If you want to get the accurate rendition of the, the original okay. stereo image. But, right. but of course, you're still going to hear stereo. It's yes, just that it will sure. be the wrong way around. So the if you're way watching around. some, some singer on stage, if they're on the right side of the stage when the recording was made, but you put the earphones on the wrong way around, they will appear on the left side of your, the stage in your imagination because your left ear will hear a louder sound than the right ear. All right. Great. Yeah, Evan, thanks, thanks very much. Thanks for that one. Thanks, guys. Please, yeah. Rant. There we go. Unless you're listening to Justin Bieber, you're going to want to take out the headphones anyway. It's not going to make a difference. <laughs> um, let's go. Let's move on to David in front of Bell Park. Hello, David. How did you know? Hi, Chris. Good. Um, I was arguing with a colleague of mine the other day. Um, if you walk barefoot on cold surface and if you move from a extreme temperature from hot to cold, do you really get sick or is it just giving razor away so you believe you're going to get sick? Because I can't see a virus entering your body just because you go from hot to cold. Yeah, hello, David. Th this is probably a big myth. I don't think there's any very good evidence that uh, going out with wet hair, getting cold or whatever causes you to catch pneumonia or catch your death or, or walk on cold surfaces causing you to get various things. Um, this is probably not true. That's not to say that going out for prolonged periods and getting very cold uh, won't necessarily mean that you could be exposed to something, as in uh, there are viruses around in the environment and if you're outside where they are, you might catch something. Also, getting very cold might mean that the immune system doesn't work as well because you're putting more energy into trying to stay warm than your immune function, but there's no really good consistent evidence that getting wet hair and going out with wet hair or whatever the, the, the myths say is true. All right, great. So this is where I can say I told you so. Yeah. <laughs> you certainly can. <laughs> Stop picking a fight with the wife, David. Uh, let's go from David to Dave. What's the difference? Well, the one's in Goodwood, the other one's in front of Bell Park. Hello, Dave. Hello. Da Hello, Dave. Yes, we can hear you. Chat to us. Can you hear Okay. Uh, my question to the uh, scientist is uh, about um, hemp oil which has been used uh, around the world for over 600 years for curing all sorts of diseases like cancer and everything else. But in this country and most other countries, it's illegal, except for Canada, where I get it from. But it cost me 16 rand for a small bottle 
sixteen dollars, sorry, for a small bottle plus all the uh, other costs involved. Why is it uh, so good and nobody uses it? Chris, you got that? Hello, Dave. Yep. Well, I've I've never actually come across it. Um, obviously, I know this sort of thing exists, but I've never actually come across it being used. So I'm afraid that I don't know of any good quality clinical data showing that it works or any uh, just sort of anecdotal evidence that it, that it works. So um, I'll have to take a look into that. I'm sorry I can't help you, Dave. Okay, thanks. But I do know that uh, it is obtainable in Canada and I do use it very successful for most diseases, including cancer. Well, if, you, if you'd like to send me some more details, my email address is chris at thenakedscientists.com and I'll take a look at it for uh, you. Uh, well, where I first uh, picked it up was uh, here in Cape Town. We have uh, Cape Town Television and they have a uh, whole um, right. uh, uh, documentary on this uh, from Canada. And okay, I now Dave, my brother, what I'm going to ask you to do, okay, is to send it, and it's Naked Scientists from S at the end. Send it to Chris, and uh, I'm sure he'll definitely get back to you on that one. Uh, now, I'm going to have to ask you this, but I don't know how to pronounce the name, the word. Let me try it anyway. Excitement around the neurodegenerative disease breakthrough. <laughs> Jeez, I can never get it right. <laughs> Tell us a bit about that one, Chris, uh, around this, ne um, this neurodegenerative disease breakthrough. Yes, well, there's a paper in the journal Nature this week. It's by researchers in Japan. This is someone called Junko Sasaki, who's at Akita University. And this research group have been looking at why brain cells die, because obviously the loss of brain cells is what underlies the word you were struggling to say, neurodegenerative diseases, like Parkinson's disease, another one called Huntington's disease, and Alzheimer's disease. And one reason that nerve cells die in those conditions is because they get put into a state called excito toxicity sounds like it should be the name of a band or something but excitotoxicity is where a nerve cell becomes active and because it becomes active it becomes metabolically stressed and because it becomes metabolically stressed this makes it become even more active because it squirts out various chemicals that increase the activity of the cell and this goes around in a positive vicious cycle or feedback loop which ultimately results in the death of the cell and scientists have been trying to fathom out what causes this this group in Japan have been studying a signal that cells make when they first become uh, active or mm. when they first start to fire off nerve impulses. And, and it's a signal called phosphatidylinositol 3,4-bisphosphate, or IP2. And it only hangs around in the cell for a very short time. And that's because the product of a gene called INPP4A breaks it down very quickly. So what this group in Japan did was to take mice and remove from the mice this INPP4A gene so they can't break down this signal. And what they found is that their mice developed damage to their brain cells very similar to diseases like Huntington's disease. Their cells, in other words, were going into these excitotoxic states. Mm. Now, why this is interesting and important is that no one's actually tried to hit this signal or block this signal with a drug to protect nerve cells before. And this suggests that if we can find a way to block this signal selectively in vulnerable nerve cells or perhaps boost the activity of this uh, enzyme IMPP4A that the gene IMPP4A makes, it might be possible to therefore rescue or prevent nerve cells from being broken down. So it's a really interesting lead in how we might be able to treat brain cell disorders in future. The Naked Scientist with us, of course, on Talk Radio 702 567 Cape Talk. And I'm going to go to some of those SMSs as well, Chris. And I, I get so sick and tired of people who are nasty to Julius Malema. They use nasty words. I'm sure you know who Julius Malema is, don't you, Chris? I was actually reading about him. He's, yeah. he's actually been, he got fined, didn't he? I was reading yes, about him in the newspaper yesterday. He got a 900, I think he got fined 900 pounds. Something like so that. A few, yeah. Uh, so, yes, because he was, he was actually saying nasty things about his party. Absolutely. But uh, we can now officially use nice words about him, and we can say that Julius <laughs> Malema is exotoxicitized. <laughs> is what we're going to call him. <laughs> he won't know what that means, and he won't get upset, but we all know now what it means. He's exotoxicitized. Now, I've got somebody who has asked a very cool question, and I think we all use this term immune system and we don't really know what it is so what is the immune system the immune system is actually the one thing that makes it possible for us to survive and exist actually um, because every organism on earth whether you're a bacterium or a virus or a whole big person is doing battle with every other organism on earth we're all competing with each other for space and food 
and access to energy. Usually mm -hmm. if you're a plant, that means getting light from the sun. If you're a human, that means something to eat. And because everyone's competing with everybody else, we're always in some kind of arms race. And we're certainly locked into an arms race with the microbial world. So mm -hmm. we have to fend off the assault of bacteria and viruses all the time. And we have a defense system, which includes cells that can kill microorganisms and cells that become infected with microorganisms and we also have antibodies these are little y-shaped pieces of protein that lock onto and neutralize foreign invaders including bacteria viruses whole cells or infected cells and the immune system is an immune system because it isn't just a static defense it's not like just building uh, say a big fence and using that to hold people back the immune system is important because it adapts and changes you have what's called adaptive immunity and what that means is that when the immune system encounters a threat it can reprogram itself or adjust itself to become better at defending against that threat in future and that's how vaccination works when you're exposed to a pathogen um, for instance, you might have a flu shot or something. What that does is expose your immune system to something it hasn't seen before, but the immune system then responds to having seen that bit of flu mm. and makes a response so that next time flu comes along, you are much less vulnerable to its effects. So that's why it's called an immune system, because it makes you immune in future. Now, someone just thought of us, and I don't know why, but I've got an SMS here saying, Kino, why is it that one's urine smells so quickly after eating asparagus? Well, I'm not sure that everybody's does, but this is a common observation. It's 15 to 20 minutes after eating asparagus. The in people who seem to be susceptible to this, and I think also not everyone can smell the effect, but it is very whiffy. And the reason is asparagus contains very sulphur compounds. When you eat the asparagus, it gets initially digested, and these sulphur compounds are rapidly absorbed through the wall of the stomach and small intestine because they're small molecules. They go round in the bloodstream, and they are very water-soluble once they've been metabolized a bit. And that means that when they go through the kidney, when the kidney filters blood to make urine, Anything that dissolves well in water will move out quite well into the urine, um, which you're making in the kidney, but then because it's water-soluble, it can't get back across the cells that line the ducts in the kidney because they're full of fat, so it stays in the liquid that the kidney makes, and this means it gets concentrated in urine. And when you wee it out, because it's got sulphur in it, sulphur tends to make very smelly compounds, so you notice it. That is the Naked Scientist with us, and uh, <laughs> the lifespan of a fly. How long is the lifespan of a fly? I, I, would, I would hazard a guess and say um, it depends how quickly the fly swatter gets to it. But uh, generally speaking... Yes, or the fly spray, that's right. That's true. Um, it depends on the species, actually. Mm. Um, some flies just hang around for a day. Some flies, uh, I mean, if you look at some of these seasonal flies that emerge from, from various larvae that live in the aquatic environment, they, they may have a lifetime of a day, during which time they have to find a mate, mate, lay eggs, and then they die. Other flies, and mosquitoes are a good example of this, can actually hibernate. Some of the mosquitoes that scientists have been studying in various countries, they will, when it gets cold over winter, find a window ledge or something or a small hole, they crawl into it, they switch their metabolism down, and they will spend the winter effectively in a, in a low activity state and then they come out again when the weather's warm um, other insects flies butterflies the monarch butterfly in north america migrates thousands of miles five thousand miles down to mexico spends the summer in mexico and then migrates all the way back to north america and canada again in the winter uh, in the following summer so these animals have a very long lifespan so it really is horses for courses, to take another animal analogy. Some mm. animal species, insect species, live for a long time, others don't. Okay, my cash put in a stupid question. Does the monarch butterfly look anything like the queen? Uh, no. They're, they're, <laughs> well, I'm not really sure how a queen would r r really resemble a butterfly, but um, they're very big and they're very beautiful, actually. So apart from in name, I don't think they do. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, check the queen out, didn't hear me say that, by the way. No, didn't she? <laughs> you said horse earlier, but I was gonna, I'll was going to. i not talk about Camilla right now. Uh, anyway, listen, thank you so much, Chris, with, of course, The Naked Scientist. And the website, www.thenakedscientists.com. Make sure you get there. Look forward to the next chat, Chris. Have a good one. Thanks, Kino. See you soon. Definitely.